The teaching that I would like to look at today is quite interesting. It's found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 46, verse 10. God is speaking here, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My purpose shall stand, and I will fulfill my intention. It's interesting to notice that God is saying here that He is declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things not yet done. In other words, before God is to do something, He is declaring it ahead of time. He knows the end result that He is going to reach before He is going to reach it. There is great wisdom in that. God wants us to be imitators of Him. He wants us to learn from Him. So when you and I plan in our lives, when you and I make choices in our lives, let's say we want to choose a spouse to marry, we want to choose a career to do, we want to build a home or a business, or whatever we choose to do that is to be in the future. If we are to act like God does, we are to think of the end result before we start. In other words, I should be saying to myself, okay, if I make this decision today, if I make a decision to marry this spouse today, for example, will I like this spouse being the way they are today, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, when children come, when choices in life come, when pressures come, will I be able to handle our relation with this spouse? And if at that moment I have cautions, red flags, no, this habit is not good, or that way of speaking is not good, or acting is not good, then that should be a warning signal to me at that time that the end result will not be very good for me. So I should not proceed. For example, if you make a choice to choose a career. And sometimes when people are young, they, they want careers that appeal to them in some way or another. Without thinking, how will this career choice help me to provide for my family? How will I be able to take care of my children, pay my bills? And often they go through an educational system, and I am all for education, but they go through an educational choice which eventually does not provide them a job or does not provide sufficient income for them, and they struggle continuously. So it is not then a good choice. I should think what the end result of an action will be before I choose it. Or sometimes there are foolish choices. For example, if we say, you know, I'm going to drink one beer or I'm going to drink one glass of wine. My father was an alcoholic and still is. I don't drink even a little bit of any alcohol. No beer, no wine, uh, no alcohol whatsoever. I committed myself to abstain from alcohol for life because I've seen what my father has done. You know what he said to me, son, when you take the first glass it's a little bit hard. When you take the second glass, it's a little bit easier. And the third one is already inviting the fourth one, and so on. So it kind of leads you into a path of destruction. So you have to think, will this choice of drinking that one glass be good enough for me? If I think of the end result, it will not be good. My father destroyed his life. Uh, it, it blurs your ability to think. It weakens your ability to think, you make wrong choices, accidents, all kinds of things. And then you de devastate your economy as well, your health. The same thing with cigarettes, with drugs. Or when you start speaking, for example, to your spouse. You're married now, and you start speaking. Do you think, before you speak, or act in a way to your spouse, what kind of result that speech and action will create in that spouse, in your marriage? Is this what you are saying to your spouse, going to bring goodness, going to inspire, going to 
develop the spirit, good spirit of the relationship? Or is it going to hurt it, harm it? What kind of end result will the words that I speak today to my spouse create? Will the results be the ones that I really like or not? And if I will not like them, then don't speak them. The same thing about my children, the same thing about any choice. For example, if I want to, let's say God says I should be tithing my money, and I choose not to tithe my money, not to give the 10% that belongs to God. According to Malachi, when I do that, I rob God. If I rob God, He does not bestow His blessing upon me. I work hard, it says there, and I'm not able to earn a lot. I eat a lot, and I'm not satisfied because that is a curse upon my life. No father would like to give to his children anything if he knows that they rob him. So the same is with God. But if we give our tithes, he says, bring in your tithes in the storehouse of God, and you will see how I will open the gates of heaven and bless you. In other words, God is going to bless you with His blessing so that not only will you be able to succeed when you work and earn enough money, but there will, He will destroy uh, or block the destroyers, those things that block you from earning and striving financially. So it is so important to think of the end result. For example, uh, if you do try it, but then you say everything else that I make, I, I'm, I'm, I have to pay for this, I have to pay for that. I don't really have money to put aside. Now, as I said, when you don't give to God your tithes and your offerings, you're robbing God. The same way, if you don't put aside a certain percentage, in my view and belief, it is to double whatever you give to God to put aside for your future investments to grow, then you are robbing your own future. So when the time comes that you need to pay for a new fridge or a car or, or some medical bills or, or maybe retirement, you don't have enough money. Just last night, late at night, around 11 o'clock p.m., I was talking with a 55-year-old man. He has two children that are grown up now that went through educational system with loans and debts, and he has to sell his house and move out from where he lives, and he says, Slobodan, when I sell my house, I'll be just at break-even point. I don't have a penny on my name at 55. And he's educated, but he does not handle his money well. You know, it takes discipline, but you have to think of the end at the beginning if you want to succeed with your money. Uh, this second part of the verse, it says, My purpose shall stand, and I will fulfill my intention. You know, not only that we should be thinking of the end result, of our words and actions that we are going to take at the beginning and then based on the end result make a decision whether we should proceed or not. If it, the end result is not good we should not proceed there. But it says here that my purpose shall stand and I will fulfill my intention. In other words, I have made a purpose, I have made an intention and I'm going to fulfill it. Sometimes people have good plans. They even plan the end result but they expect somehow somebody to come around and hand them that end result on the platter. Now, I can tell you that every good result in your life will come as a result of you and I putting the effort in it. If you and I do not put purpose, focused intention and action to bring about that result in our lives, we will not get it. For example, you want to be healthy. God says He wants you healed. You can pray, and we need to pray for one another to be healed. But maybe God wants you to do something. If you got sick because you ate the wrong food, God will not change your diet. You have to do it. Or if you need to lose weight, He will not run around the blocks for you. You have to do it. I mean, it's, it's easier for God to run around the block, isn't it? I wish him to do that for me, but he says, no, so then you got to do that. In other words, I have to put that effort. Or if I am to reach a financial goal, for example, he won't save for me. I have to do the saving. And he won't give for me. I have to do the giving for me. I have to give my tithes and offerings. It has to be my desire, my decision to do it consciously, regularly. And it has to be my desire and, and purpose and action to put aside and be disciplined enough to not allow to have everything now, but to save for the future and invest. 
And the same thing is for my marriage, if I want my marriage to succeed. I can't just expect my spouse to do her part, or if it is a wife, to expect the husband to do his part. We each have to do our part. But the result that I'm going to reap in my relationship with my spouse, to a greater measure, depends on what I do rather than what my spouse does. So I can succeed in my marriage if I put my effort in it. God wants me to, to do it. It says here, I will fulfill my intention. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to reach your goal? For example, you want to get a good education. God will not study for you. You have to be willing to fulfill your intention. So that means paying for the courses, going to the classes, studying, doing research, and doing the exams, passing the tests, instead of watching the movies, listening to music, unless it is related to your studies. Doing whatever it takes to focus on that goal and reaching it. It's really up to you. God does the same thing. So he says that we should learn from him. God wants you and me to put our maximum effort to whatever desired end we would like to achieve in our goal lives. It might be, as I said, to be healthy. There are ways of doing that. It might be to be financially successful. There are ways of doing that. It might be to be relationally with our spouse healthy. Maybe I should just finish with this last thought. It might be that we grow spiritually. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, we read, Enoch, or Enoch, walked with God. You know, the Hebrew verb there, walked with God, is hit haleka. Hit halak. Halak is to walk, and hit is a reflexive term. In other words, it means he caused himself to walk with God. Even our relationship with God. If we want to grow in our relationship with God, it really depends on what you and I are willing to do. The Word of God is there as much for you as it is for anyone, Billy Graham or whoever. The Word of God teaches you as much as it does teach any great preacher or evangelist or a great person, woman or man of God. If they have succeeded through the Word of God in relationship with Him, you too have the equal access, the same time, the same Word, and the same Spirit is there for you and me. Now, how much you and I grow spiritually depends also on how much you and I want to cause ourselves to walk or to live or to relate to God. God will not read the Bible for you and me. You and I have to do it. God will not meditate upon it. You and I have to do it. God will not speak it for you and me. You and I have to do it. God will not act upon it. You and I have to do it. He will act upon His Word. But when you want the results that the Word gives, you have to be the one acting upon it. So may I encourage you to think of the end at the beginning. Think of the result that your choices, that your words and your actions will bring about at the end, not just in the beginning. Don't just start a relationship. Don't just start an action and don't know where it leads. Make sure you know where it leads. But then once you have decided the end result that you want to achieve, do everything that you need to do Ask God to give you wisdom and to put an effort to reach that goal. God will do that because He has set an example for you and me to follow. So when you and I act in that way, we act the way God is pleased. And you and I are going to be blessed. You and I are going to reach goals that we like, the results that we will enjoy. And as you and I do that, we'll be more fun people to be with. People will enjoy being around us because we will have more fun with God and with ourselves and with others.